Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for everybody who's joining us now for this webinar, um, which is a series, uh, one of a series of six webinars that Epic are presenting this week. Um, each of the webinars focuses on a particular aspect of the lived experience within the care system. Um, webinars that we've um, run already this week include education, ethnicity and race, LGBT and accommodation. And today in this webinar, we're looking at the, the issue of disability for children in care and young people within the care system. And that includes young people in aftercare. Um, it's run in conjunction with Care Day, which happens this Friday, uh, February 19th. Care Day is an international celebration of the positive experiences and the positive outcomes of, of children and young people in the care system, which sometimes gets overlooked with, I suppose, all of the other pieces around the system and, and what changes we need to make. But um, we're delighted to welcome everybody, we're delighted to be able to have this and run this webinar today. Um, and I immediately, I'm just going to introduce myself. My name is Terry Dignan. I am the former CEO of Epic. Um, former in that I'm currently handing over to the new CEO, Marissa Ryan. Um, and again, wishing Marissa all the very best with her new role and, and with the challenges and all the positive outcomes I think we can look forward to um, for children and young people in care. I think probably some of the issues we're going to look at today um, include, you know, the lived experiences of children and young people with a disability in care and aftercare. Obviously, some of the challenges that disability presents for children and young people in the care system and also for the professionals and carers who work with them. Um, and then what approaches and supports can help in addressing some of these challenges or the systemic issues to ensure that children and, and young people with a disability in care have, I suppose, the similar and, and the same outcomes as their non-care peers. The, the title of these series of webinars is basically, you know, looking for equity um, to produce equality. And I think the, the focus of most of these is equity. What is it within the structures that exist for children and people in care that is inequitable? What are the additional supports that they need to give them you know, an equal chance to everybody else in attaining, you know, and and um, I suppose fulfilling all of their ambitions and all of their, I suppose, dreams. So that's really the, the kind of the context in which this is set. So during this particular webinar, we're going to hear from seeing people with uh, disabilities, um, their own lived experience of that. And then we will also have input from professionals, both practitioners and academics working in the area of care, disability and social policy and, and looking at all this through the prism of care and the care system. So in advance of the webinar today, I'd first like to thank the organized committee from EPIC for who, who set up this particular webinar and, and all of the others uh, to the participants in advance for their support of our webinar series and also the contribution. And I think before I go any further, I will um, introduce them to you. But I also just want to remind you that during this webinar, um, please do um, post questions. Um, you're, you, everybody's able to post questions. If there are questions and comments you want to make, please do post them. We'll try and get to as many of those as we can, both during the webinar and at the end of the, of the webinar. At the very end of the webinar, we'll have a live Q&A with, with a live panel. And if you have questions you want to put to the panel or members of the panel, please send them in. And I, again, I'll try to get it to as many of those as I can. Um, and also, uh, just going back to Care Day, if you're posting on social media, I'd encourage everyone to use the, the tag, uh, hashtag Care Day 21, um, which again, as I said, is this Friday. So if you can do that, that would be great. And thank you for that. So just moving back then to the contributors to our webinar today, um, we have a number of speakers um, in pre recorded session. And I'll introduce them briefly now. The first person we meet is Tracy McCann. Um, Tracy was diagnosed with a disability known as rapid onset muscular dystonia. Um, Tracy, she's a best-selling author, she's an international motivational speaker, she's a life coach, she's a disability advocate and also uh, an ambassador for the Anunua um, Academy. So um, Tracy is obviously a very, very busy person with all of that. We'll also have an input and participation from Joanna Reardon um, and some of you may be familiar with Joanne. Um, Joanne also has a rare physical disability known as total amelia. Um, probably some people remember she spoke to the UN in 2012 and challenged that um, body to create technology to help disabled people like herself. She was Young Person of the Year at the People of the Year Awards in 2012. She's a very, very prominent activist for people with disabilities, a motivational speaker and also a sports columnist, columnist with the Irish Times. Um, Alan Fay um, will participate in a discussion with Joanne. Alan is, again, 
a young man with a disability. He's a member of Epic's National Youth Council, and he's also um, um, a very active disability advocate. And then when we come finally to the Q&A panel, um, Alan will be joined in that with Dr. Pat McGarty. And Pat is a senior lecturer in the School of Health and Social Sciences at Munster Technological University. Um, Pat's been heavily involved in development and delivery of social care education at Loan Institute of Technology at the Technological University Dublin and Munster Technological University. Pat's a founding member and board member of both the Social Care Ireland and the Irish Association of Social Care Educators. And he was also president of the Irish Association of Social Care Educators between 2010 and 12. He's currently the vice president. And he was chairman um, of the Qualifications Quality Ireland National Standards and Social Care Committee and has served as part of the programmatic review of quality assurance accreditation panels across the third level education sector. You, you just give up when you see what all of these people are doing. It's, it's kind of unbelievable. And Pat is a recipient of the Social Care Ireland National Award for his contribution to the social care profession. So, so from a social policy perspective, I think we'll be looking to Pat when we come to that. And uh, with Pat on that panel will be Charlotte Burke. Um, Charlotte started a career in social care within the disability sector and worked for the, has worked for the same organisation now for 20 years. Um, she's worked in residential units, day centres, workshops. She supported employment, coordinated one-to-one -one individual services and training centres. She became a social care leader in 2004 and is, she's a very, very strong advocate for the rights of people with disabilities to live a life of their choosing with support from, from staff and other professionals. Um, currently, she works in Social Care Ireland as the CPD coordinator. And Social Care Ireland, as I'm sure many of you know, is the professional representative body for the social care profession in Ireland. So a really, really strong lineup of people, both in the initial um, recorded pieces and also in the question and answer panel. So um, with that, again, I'll encourage you to ask questions and, and make comments. And um, enough for me for the time being. I think we will now um, hand over to um, a piece from Tracy McCann. So if you could, if you could roll that now, Peter, thank you. Hello. It is good to be here and to be part of this wonderful event. I would like to introduce myself. I am Tracy McCann. I love being outside in nature. I love keeping fit and healthy. And I love being around my family and friends. I am proud to call myself a two-time best-selling author, empowerment speaker, and coach too. I regard myself as the voice of the voiceless, which is very fitting for me. I help individuals gain confidence, feel connected, and live the life that they truly deserve. I recently got married to my lifelong partner. He is such brilliant support to me. He assisted me with getting to where I am today. We have traveled all over the world together. I wanted to share my achievements and my accomplishments with you. Not to show off, but to show you what is possible. To show you the positive possibilities that you can make happen for yourself. Whatever they may be, this does not have to be anything too difficult, or something that does not feel right for you. Remember, that you have absolutely nothing to prove to anyone. It is about filling your own cup of fulfillment, and establishing what it is that will give you a sense of purpose. What is it that will fill you with pride? What is it that will fill you with happiness? Even if that happiness only lasts for a few seconds. My name is Tracy McCann, and I know what it is like to feel so alone, frustrated, sad, and angry at the life that I had. I spent the earlier part of my life looking out my window, socially isolated, and not knowing how I can live the life, that I knew I wanted, that I felt I deserved, and that I would truly have loved. I felt as though my life was passing me by, and nothing good was happening for me. I felt worthless, and disempowered. I knew that I needed to wake up and be grateful for the little things. I needed to focus on what I can do, and take a stretch outside of my comfort zone. I knew that I needed to develop my own social skills, and to allow myself to be seen. 
I knew that I needed to grow, mentally and physically. I would now like, if you do not mind, to share with you a piece from my first book. This piece is taken directly from Chapter 9 of my book, which is called Recommenced Motivation Greater Than Limitation To me, living life is trying my hand at anything and experiencing new things. I love traveling and connecting with new people. My motto is, what is the point in traveling to the other side of the world? and not attempting on connecting with at least one new person. To me, that is what makes traveling so exciting. I now know that as long as I visualize a great life for myself, it will happen, because I will remain focused on seeing it through. It is now all happening for me. I used to be fed up, living that old life that I had, and feeling as though I wanted and deserved more and so I stopped at nothing to get it. If anything, this should prove to you that you can do whatever you desire in life. Stop dreaming. Wake up. And go make it happen. Nobody else can do it for you. And nobody else should be expected to. The Buddha, once famously said, When watching after yourself, you watch after others. When watching after others, you watch after yourself. I just wanted to share that with you, so that you realize the importance of self-care, and the caring of others. For me, self-care was always about being creative, and then using my creations, to help others. Another very important thing that I want to mention to you is this. You are here on this planet as your own unique individual, with your own unique gifts. There is nobody in the world like you. Whatever your current living situation is, or even if you feel like you do not have the family support that you feel you need, I encourage you to write a gratitude list every day. This will not change your situation overnight, but you will begin to notice how it changes your perspective of you, your situation, and your life as a whole. While doing your daily gratitude list, Pay special notice to who is supportive of you, and who acknowledges you, and your wonderful existence. I also encourage you to look within yourself, and focus on what it is that is hidden within you, that which you can develop and expand on, without me ever meeting you. I know that you have so many talents. Talents that you probably are not even aware of yet. Talents that you may not even think that you are capable of. I encourage you to help yourself with feeling more positive each day. And remember, by helping yourself, this will reflect onto others around you. Learn to realize that you are truly amazing. You are loved by others. And you deserve to feel happy, appreciated, and fulfilled. Your life is your own canvas to paint on. So have fun. Enjoy the process. And get creative. Thank you very much. So I think um, a really good way to start. I think you know a really powerful message um, around hope and optimism, also around, um, I suppose, motivation being greater than limitation, which is a good phrase, and I think one that that you know we I, we we should consider. And also visualization and self-care. I think it's a testament to Tracy that she has taken on that attitude and achieved what she has, considering the limitations she herself has found she has. But I think a really, really positive message to start with. Before we go into the next piece, which is a conversation between Joanne and Alan, um, I just wanted to, to maybe you know comment a little bit further around the whole experience of children uh, with a disability in care where we don't have a lot of data um, and research in this country, international research would have found that um, children with a disability in the care system are at higher risk generally, um, higher risk of living in, in an appropriate placement, more susceptible to abuse and neglect of different kinds. Um, and there are a number of factors which, which I suppose, you know, increase their level of vulnerability, including, um, you know, lack of mobility, limited communication, the need for intimate care, lack of awareness of, of disability issues, 
And I think, you know, one of the things that the webinar today will speak to is something that's come up in some of the other webinars, you know, around um, education, for example, that children with a disability have a number of challenges. Children with a disability in the care system and in care have additional challenges. And I think that's the piece that's that's sometimes missed that, you know, children in care are a specific cohort with particular needs um, the disability if any child with disability or a young person with disability adds to those needs, but the, the needs that come through simply being in care um, are significant enough. So what we're trying to do, I suppose, through this is create awareness that the disability challenges are one thing and then the care system and the care experience adds to the vulnerability and needs of many children and young people in care and in aftercare. So I suppose we're trying to speak to that, but thanks to Tracy for that start which I suppose gives us key messages and um, some food for thought and what we do now is we'll move on to a conversation between Alan Fay. again Alan is a member of our National Youth Council and Joanna Reardon who I introduced a little earlier and this conversation is really between the two of them around their own challenges and their own lived experience of disability and I think it raises a lot of questions and and maybe increases awareness of some of the issues that we we sometimes maybe forget so with that i'll hand over to you peter and thank you for that hi i'm alan from the epic national new council and today um this is as part of our webinar and today um I have a very special guest um, in Joanna Rudin. Thanks for doing this, Joanne, today. Um, it's a real pleasure to get to talk to you today. So, so thank you. Do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Yes. Yeah. Well, firstly, the pleasure is that the pleasure is all mine, Alan. Um, really appreciate um you having me on to talk to you um at the epic webinar um so yeah obviously my name is joanna reardon um i'm from mill street county cork i know alan you'll disagree but like it is the best place and the real capital for sure on, in wow. ireland um so yeah i'm i'm 24 i was born on the 24th of april 1996 and i grew up in a family of five um, with three older brothers and one older sister. So I was born with a rare condition known as total amelia, meaning I was born without all of my limbs. Um, and there's no medical reason um, as to why this happened, but I'm only one of seven people in the world um, born with the condition. So yeah, tell me a bit about yourself, Alan. Like this is this is your chat. I'm, I'm your guest, but you tell me about you. Um... <laughs> I'm actually 20, I'm Alan, and I have cerebral palsy, um, plus scoliosis, which means when I, when I was born, a lack of oxygen went to my, my brain, which caused um, my condition. Um, but... I don't let my disability get in the way of um, my life. I try to live as independent as possible. Obviously, obstacles get, get in the way, um, but I don't um, let that define me as a person or let that get in the way or um, basically I don't let it battle I don't let it battle my uh, head like I kind of just try to get on with it um, I have I'm a very passionate young lad for the right of people with disabilities as well. Um, and I have a um, blog that I uh, go on on Facebook. It's called Life with Disability. I made the page 
to raise the awareness of problems that I face or problems that I overcome. Um, I'm trying on yourself as a person with disability. We face many challenges. You know, it's like you you were talking about your your challenges kind of earlier. Like, I mean, even though like we're very different, like I think we probably have the same challenges. So, like, like I know, for example, that the issues that I would kind of face every single day are things that kind of everyday people um, would take for granted. So. Like I'm relying on someone to get me up in the morning. I'm relying on someone to take me to the toilet, do showering, dress me. Um, I can feed myself, thankfully. I, I don't know. Can you feed yourself? Uh, sure. Certain stuff I can. Um, yeah. The likes of chips and uh, finger food, ba- finger food, basically, I can, yeah, but... Yeah, that's all, that's all you'd be eating anyway, it's go in with the fancy spaghetti bolognese and, and different things like that, sure, like, that's what you want every day, chicken nuggets and chips, for sure, um, but yeah, no, I mean, you're probably the same, or probably similar enough to me, so, um, I've had, um, my parents basically looking after me for about 18 years, um, so yeah, no, I know your situation is a little bit is a little bit different. So I think for context for me, as I said, I grew up in a family of five. Um, I'm the youngest by eight years, so I always had someone around definitely to look after me and to give out to and to do different things. Now my brother's um, ways of looking after me included Batista bombs and tombstone pile drivers and various oh. WWE. Oh my god. <laughs> so you probably had a nicer experience than, than what I had, right? Yeah. Um no, no I I it can be difficult but I um don't like it in the way basically I try to live every day like it's the last one base basically and um I suppose it's a bit different for me because I've been through the career system and uh, through, through family problems. My ma, my mom and dad fell into uh, drug addiction, unfortunately. So my grandparents, very kindly, stepped in when the when the problem got too much let's say um so i'm really grateful for that um yeah so alan like basically i know we were talking you know that we have very different experiences and different things like that like i know when i was in college like i studied all the policy stuff and the really boring stuff around the care system so like, I think all the stuff that I was kind of writing about was basically how the, and this obviously could get very heavy, so just to just shut me up in advance. Um, so I was basically writing about basically how the system is kind of pre-flawed and pre-judged already due to the way that like it's it's kind of set up in the world so that for people like us um, with disabilities and people, um, I suppose, with intellectual and, and various kind of disabilities, um, the system is already kind of stacked against us um, and that basically in advance, um, you know, we're already kind of at a disadvantage due to the fact of the way we were born. So I actually compared it and you're going to die laughing when I tell you. So I actually compared it to Tinder, basically, um, and how Tinder is basically an algorithm. <laughs> I know, right? So I basically compared it to how um, Tinder, Tinder is like, <laughs> how Tinder is like an algorithm. So basically what that means is how basically the people that are shoved in front of you are people who the app thinks that you will like. And I kind of feel like sometimes with, with the care system and with the HSE and Tusla and all those kind of people, they're kind of pre-assigned to pushing the people that who they think will succeed and achieve the most um, in advance. Um, they're pushing them forward kind of like at, at the most, if that makes sense. Um, and therefore it would look good kind of on their reputation then when they succeed and then when people can go back and be like, well, yeah, I was adopted or, or I'm in the care uh, system. I turned that's, up 
fine. That's basic. That's basically what the queer system is. They kind of. It's like Tinder. That's good to know. <laughs> they kind of want people to succeed, but no. They don't want people to succeed, but when they do succeed, they take the credit for it. Yeah, it's like Tinder. Like, I mean, it's basically like, you know, they, they push people in front of you to have a relationship with. They don't give you the tools and how to be in that relationship. They don't give you the tools and how to survive. But at the same time, like the big tick is that if you get married, your first headline is going to be, yeah, we met on Tinder. So I kind of feel it, it might be the same with the health system. Like you can talk from your experience, but I don't know, like, did you feel you were given any tools? Like obviously your grandparents were a great help to you for sure. But did you find that like you weren't given any tools from any like registered HSC or TUSLA official um, in advance? Um, <laughs> I, like, when I was in the current system, I was fairly, like, young. I was kind of, like, unsure, like, as to what was going on. I seen, I seen so many different social workers and so many, like, I've been to, like, so many meetings and it was kind of daunting for me, like, like any young person that would be in the care system, like seeing social workers upon social workers, yeah, going to so many meetings, like I went, like I went to care and review meetings, like I didn't, I didn't want to kind of go back to live with my mom yeah. or um or dad, um but. If I hear the word reunification one more time, I'm gonna scream. Because yeah. that's what that's what a social that's what so many social workers said to me. Like, would you like to reunificate with your man? Or um or would you like to build that relationship with your mom again? Did like, you like did you find that like they weren't giving you maybe like the tools to potentially do that with your I know you don't want to, but did you find that like they were just telling you to do it without telling you how to do it? Does that make sense? They they were giving me too much tools. Um okay. too much tools which I didn't want to I didn't want to use the tools to build that re reunification back up because I was I was so young and I didn't like understand yeah. fully like why why they're asking me to rebuild something that I don't want to rebuild yeah it's like hey you go you go you go build this house but we're not going to give you any tools to do it. How are you going to build the house then? Yeah. It's like, you can tell me this stuff, but I'm not going to do it. And it's, like, at, at the same time, like you're a child, so like you don't know, like you don't know, like, because you're, you're just a child, like the things you should be worrying about are which ball am I going to kick at which which person tomorrow morning? Like, which footballer yeah. can I support? Like, that's the thing yeah. you want to be yeah. focusing on, right? It's fine, yeah. It, and they said to me, like, I've had so many, like, they said when I was in the care system and going to meetings, they said, do you want access, access visits with your mom? And like, why do you, why do you use the word access? It's just going to see a map. Yeah. Like, it's not, it's, it's not like, oh, this person doesn't know Alan. So it's kind of like, why use the word access when I already know who this person is? Who I'm going to see. So it's just like, 
boy. You could say, do you want to go see your mum again? Or do you want to go, do you want to go visit your mum or? Like, 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 even if they say to you, like, do you want to go to like McDonald's with your mom and like one of us will be in the corner? Like, do you think if it was phrased to you like that, it would have been a bit more, not like enticing, but a bit, a bit more like. It's, it's the word they use, it's the language yes. they use. Like, That's what I mean. Like, whereas if they were like, do you want to go to McDonald's to see your mom and one of us will be sitting two tables over, do you think that would have been like nicer to hear rather than as you said, like all those big words, like access to your mom, like it sounds very clinical. Yeah, I, I would even contemplate that, like, like I said, like if we, if they said, do you want to go to my family with your mom? And if you're uncomfortable at any stage, we would be sitting over there. Yeah. If you need to call us or, if you need to kind of get out of the situation, we'd be over there to help you. Like, but the word access is it's just like, access to what? She's, she's my mother. Exactly, like, and it sounds like she's in, like, I know nothing about your family situation, like, but it sounds like she's like locked up, like, that's what access to me means, that you're seeing someone literally behind like a glass, a glass wall with a telephone like that to me is what that means. I, I think as well with Tuvla now I know this is recorded but it's the reality um, <laughs> and I'm sorry if I offend anybody but um, I think with Tuvla it, it's like you're, you're, number, you're number one you're number two you're number 23, you're, yeah. number, you're number 26, and it shouldn't be the case, like, we're all human beings, like, if you, if you ask a child um, to go, like, go to the shop, pay, um, buy a bottle of milk, buy a bottle, buy a bottle of, like, Orange juice, boy, boy, like your means, like, and then the minute they turn eighteen, like, yeah, like, okay, go, go do all that on your own. Yeah, cook yeah, food, yeah. Cook food, um, cook food, live on your own, pay rent, and it's very daunting for a young person. To have, yeah, like, to, do, to have to do, to have to do when they leave the care system, like they have to look for a house, and you know, you know the way rent is in, in Ireland. Yeah. And like a a care leave like shouldn't have to do that. Like a care leave is not obligated to kind of. Right, the mini eighteen, you have to go and do, go out to the big bad world straight away, without yeah, yeah. without any life skills, without any like support. So it's really frustrating. And since I joined Epic, like the empathy I have for young people going through the care system is huge. Yeah. Because it's, it's a huge challenge and I love hearing the success stories and stuff like that but I hate hearing the bad, bad minority like stories but that's what I joined Epic for to, to help, to help with that, those challenges like and it's coming for me um, through a different perspective, having a disability going through the care system. So let's say an an able-bodied person going through the care system um, would would have less challenges 
than I would, but sometimes even more challenges than I would. Like, there's people in the care system now that are homeless, that are like, there's nowhere to go. So yeah. I've, I've, been, I've been quite lucky in the sense my grandparents stepped in. Uh, I was kind of worried if my grandparents didn't step in, I'd be like in, I won't say institution, but in a, like in a center or a residential where I'm looking at four walls. Yeah. They say, okay, you stay there. We'll knock the TV on for you, but that's all we do. Like, yeah. I was kind of worried that I was kind of going to be like, thank God my family supported me, but I always had that worry of being like isolated, left on my own. Like, because I have a disability, the, um, I thought like, right, I'm going to be like, put in a like, center, like, just to look at for walls, but uh, I, kn- I knew that wasn't going to happen in my head. Yeah. But I always had that like, worry in that sense. Um, that it could happen, like, it's kind of, like, I, I don't, I couldn't imagine what a young person in care is faced with, like, on a day-to-day basis, like, I only mentioned some of the things, but the loud so it's kind of, it's called, and it's called on Tuesday to continue to support the young person in the care system, especially in times like this with a pandemic going on. Yeah. Like, even if it's just a phone call or like Christmas, like, even if it's just a card from Anybody like like hey, on Twitter? I'm on Twitter, yeah. It's at no limbs, no limits. I love that name. It's the name of my documentary, so I kinda have to keep it going. <laughs> Say that again, no limbs, no limits. Yep, we got on one. You actually you're doing a lot better than what like some people are like, oh, so it's no limits, no limbs. I'm like, that's not what I said. That's not even close. That's it's the other way around. <laughs> okay. Um on behalf of Epic, I'd like to say thank you for the interview again. Um it really like um it really it's really gonna touch people like yeah it, it's gonna touch people in both ways for me, but like, like in the care, in the care system and having like a disability, like, but also from your aspect, like in education and your journalism and stuff like that. Um, so it's a real privilege on behalf of Epic, and I like to. Thank you um, for taking the interview. No, I'm really buzzed and thanks so much for having me on. Like I definitely learned learned so much and the next time I go to Man United to report on a game, I won't be as cruel because I'll think of I'll think of you when I'm writing on my beloved FC Barcelona smashing your beloved Man United. So no, thanks so much for having me. I really do appreciate it. And are you into GAA by any chance? Well, if you're going to talk GA, I don't have a literally a leg to stand on, both metaphorically and physically. It is the voice um, it's, it's <laughs> Well, you're a Dubs fan, so like it's different. So you know, I've I'm stuck in the lagoons of Cork. I don't. I, We're in the long grass, guys. I have a leg to 
I have a leg, but I can't stand on it. So it's uh, you're better than me. You're better than me. So no thanks. Thanks so much for for having me on. So uh, yeah, no, I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much, Alan. You're welcome, Joanne. No problem. Um, yeah, hard not to smile at the end of that. Um, I think a really, really interesting conversation between Joanne and Alan, um, which brought up a lot of themes, um, quite a few themes. But I think, you know, a, definitely two people that are living up to not being defined by their disability. But I think it was interesting, some of the things that emerged from that, such as, you know, do we use language? as a barrier, you know, Alan talked about, you know, the use of certain terms, access, sibling access. We, we've come across that before within the system. And I know there's been discussions around, you know, language being a barrier, particularly for children, but also for young people um, within that. I think what's come across from what Tracy had said earlier, and also that conversation with Joanne and Alan is independence being the goal. And I think then everything that the people around these young people can do to give them that independence, to make them more independent, I think that has to be uh, a discussion and a theme and something that we, we need to discuss more. Um, I think not being defined with disability has come through all of that. But I think the other side of that that I thought was interesting, and because Joanne doesn't have a care background and Alan does, Alan talked about the fear and the anxiety around young people when they're leaving care at 18 and how that's amplified for young people with a disability and his own concerns around uh, where he would go after 18 if he didn't have family support or, or the care of his grandparents, um, you know, moving into institutional care. And I think that's kind of something that also we need to look at in terms of what supports are available, what preparation is done, how those young people are, I suppose, prepared for that, empowered, enabled to do other things. So there are some of the things I think that we discussed with the panel um, from from the, the last two pieces we've had. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce the panel briefly again. Alan, who we just heard from is on the panel. Dr. Pat McCarthy, Pat from um, Trilly IT on, on the social policy side, and also Charlotte Burke, whom I introduced earlier um, from the, the practitioner side, but also obviously from, from a policy side as well. So we may move into the panel now if we can. And I'd encourage everybody, if you have questions, to send in the questions. I can put some of those questions to the panel. I think you see questions coming in already. I have a couple of questions that I'll put to the panel to start off as well. So um, without further ado, I think we can move into the panel now if we're ready to do that and we can begin that discussion. Charlotte. Hi, Pat. Hi, Terry, how are you doing? Good, Hi. thank you. Um, I've 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 introduced you both already to to everybody's here. We've we've quite a number of people looking. As I say, questions are coming already. Maybe for the panel, and and if Alan wants to join us as well, he can. Probably a question maybe to start from a broader perspective, and it's from a policy perspective and a social policy perspective. You know, what are the biggest challenges for young people with disabilities within the system, and also I suppose in preparation and leaving the system, and and what from your own experience, uh, both Pat and Charlotte, do you think we could do, you know, either some of the quick wins or some of the longer term pieces of work? Could I put that to you first? Yeah, um, what I would say on, on that one, Terry, and, and you spoke about, firstly, again, can I compliment um, uh, the guys there? Like, I, I watch, I've watched that piece twice now and I'm just absolutely, I, I'm, I'm just taken aback by, um, by, by, by the three of them, just absolutely superb. Uh, I'd like to tell, uh, just again, pass on to Joanne. I'm the, the, the lecturer in the boring stuff, as she was saying, point of view of, of college and that. Um, but I suppose just to answer the question really, uh, like th the main issue as I see it is, and it's consistent, and you uh, alluded to it as well, uh, Terry, is that like care leavers have specific needs. There's no doubt about that. We know that time and time again, evidence-based research will tell us that, right? But everybody seems to be, but when you go along basically and look at say care leavers say with disability, right? Again, at the end of the day, you, you know, they have what, if there is such thing as the standard needs for an awful lot of stakeholders out there, but the bottom line is they're sort of lumped together here and there, but we've got to, like from a policy point of view, we've got to keep reinforcing the fact that care leavers you know as a group they have particular needs there's no doubt about it education disability and, and the whole lot and that doesn't seem to be recognized um by policy makers out there so again it's the usual story and the deficits in public policy is the joined up thinking more than anything else 
uh, you know, I know, again, as I've said time and time again in various fora, like, you know, when we come in, we're dealing with a, a broad cohort of students, um, you know, but the whole idea from the point of view of the education system as well, the whole idea of, say, of care leavers, care leavers, you know, in the system, not recognised at all as a, uh, a particular cohort, you know, there's no doubt about that. So that's what I'd say, really, you know. Charles, I might pass that to you as well for your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. And, and again, I want to commend all the previous speakers as well today. Um, I kind of wanted to focus on uh, what's next? What's, you know, for, for meaningful jobs? So I suppose the traditional model that would be out there would be something like a day center or your training center or your workshops. And then there's been a fundamental shift with HICWA and new directions and the focus being more on individualized service provision. And Genio were, were a key stakeholder in that and providing funding for a lot of these individualized projects. And then we moved on to the task force for personalized budgets in 2018. So I suppose there has been some positive uh, progression. And the challenge is, is implementing a lot of that change when you have a lot of traditional services in big uh, service providers to more individualized services. Um, so that does it, it's going in the right direction, but the challenge there is how do we implement that and how what does that look like? And the focus is more on the assessment of each individual's needs and the services built up around those needs. Um, and there will be in other countries like Australia, uh, there is some here, there's the AT network, there's uh, the independent living movement Ireland uh, are all, you know, pushing, advocating for uh, independent living under this personalised budgets. And there will be places in Australia that will be way ahead, which have broker systems that somebody with a disability would access with their families. Um, and they didn't want to take on that role of being accountable for all that money. They may have a broker that would negotiate that for them rather than going into a big service uh, provision that we would have traditionally here in Ireland. So there is a lot of change. I suppose it's just the resources behind implementing those changes for the provision of services. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Charlotte. And and then just going back to that, because what's coming through that is that, you know, and Pat mentioned it, we see young people in care, young people in care with disability as a cohort of young people, rather than individuals' particular needs. And I think Alan spoke to that when he talked about the reunification issue, that he didn't want to be reunified, but there seemed to be part of the agenda to continue to push that agenda. I mean, is there a danger that we're falling into not looking at the individual and the needs of that specific individual. And Alan, you might have something to say on that as well. So, so tell you, yeah. They, they, when I was meeting with social workers, they constantly, constantly used, used the word. I told them, I know I mean unification, but they still continue to try to push the reunification when I already told them that I don't want it. Yeah, well, and they, that's, they constantly still try to push it. So, so it is about building those, I suppose, individual support um, systems for each young person, seeing them as an individual, particularly uh, young people leaving care with, with disability. Could I just move on briefly then, if I can, to, to you know, the, the joint protocol for interagency cooperation, because we know that effectively young people in care with a disability, some of the responsibility can fall on to the HSE, some of it on to TUSLA. I know that in 2018, you know, the, the Ombudsman was critical to some extent of, of how quickly that was being implemented and how well it was working. I mean, from, can I ask all three of you if you've seen, or you can comment on that? Might, might start with you again, Pat. Well, Go back to 2018, absolutely. Um, you know, <laughs> I was identified. But really, at the end of the day, is it working? I don't know. Most analysis would say it's bits of it. It's a little bit like the curious egg. There's bits of it, yes. But really, at the end of the day, there's an awful lot of stuff falling between two stools. And that's it, as we know that. And it's really a case of, you know, pass the parcel and that type of stuff. And I honestly think that, again, speaking to service users who ultimately will tell you, I suppose, what, what the real story is. You do uh, anecdotal evidence which suggests that like this path is not, not working at all. And that's it. Let's be straight about it. And that's mm -hmm. the bottom line. That's... 
Charlotte, what, what would your experience or your opinion be on that particular issue? Yeah, I mean, interagency collaboration is is welcomed. I mean, the joined up thinking it is is on paper uh, is a good it's progress. But absolutely, when you when you look at it uh, forensically, it is looking at two very large stakeholders trying to communicate of very different systems, and they were one HSE, if you like, and they came apart, uh, separated a number of years back. So. I suppose for, for the disability side of it, maybe there is a bit of a gap of why are those people falling through? And again, is that social care, human rights uh, perspective of um, assisted decision-making and having the capacity and building capacity to make decisions, embedding that down in person-centered practice um, and the decision-making support services uh, from the Mental Health Commission um, and Anya Flynn Again, it's finding the resources to, to have that service up and running. Um, it was planned for 2020. So I think possibly that's where the gap is between the HSC and Tusla, is having the expertise around consent and decision-making and that landscape, if you like. Um, and I think that's where that might fit so, and support that mechanism. See, I think uh, the two organizations trying to do the one thing but it doesn't it doesn't work yeah alan i just again i just going to now to some of the questions that are coming in there's a question coming in from brona thanks brona she's a student in her final year in children's disability team and she's completing narrative work with a young person who's in a similar situation she says to alan he's in care he doesn't want to leave or to have any contact with our relationship with his parents Brona said a narrative workspace on helping understand why he's in care and what happened to him in a way that's age appropriate and help him understand. Any advice you could give her on, on how to engage with him? And maybe you might kick that one off, Charlotte, if you have any, any thoughts or ideas on that. So it's really around it's really around how she engages with this with this young person who doesn't want to have a, have a relationship with his parents. Again, that's building up the relationship with this young person. Um, and if they're not ready, they're not ready. You really have to listen and actively communicate and explore, well, what are the decisions do they want to be involved in? Um, and sometimes we can park something and come back to it. And maybe that's what was happening with Alan. I'm not sure um, that people were coming back to that because family is really, you know, it is. Yeah. They, sorry, no, they, they constantly... Um... Kind of coming back to it when, when, which I understand because, as you said, family is a really big, big, big issue, and they kind of wanted to sort the situation now. My, my advice to Brown would be uh, just constantly talk to that young person and um, ask them, as you said, ask them, like, okay, if you don't want to go back to your parents or if you don't like if you don't feel comfortable what do you think the that the options are for you like as you said and then go like it's all about person centered it's all about like the person in the situation so my advice to Brownie will be continue to communicate with the person on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it, listen to what he has to say, but always make sure that he's the person making the decision, not not the stakeholders or anybody else. It needs to, it needs to be him making the decision. So that would be my advice to Brona and the the. The guy needs to be stern with stakeholders, and he basically needs to tell them, "Listen, I don't want to go back to my parents. It's my decision. You, you, you can tell me what to do. It's my own choice." So that would be my advice to Brown. Thanks, thanks, Alan. I just uh, I reinforce what Alan is saying there. Uh, that's you know, like the word here is respect, you know, and that's very, very important from the point of view of input if we go along and, and uh, 
look at that at, at that service user. You know, there's no doubt about that. And obviously, you know, where the likes of Epic come in as well, from the point of view of you know independent advocacy, that's very very important as well. And that's why, you know, in this space, you know, Epic, the role of Epic as a, a stakeholder is crucial here as well, from the point of view of support and stuff like that. And that's why. It's such an important organisation as far as I'm concerned in that space. I suppose Epic could step in in that situation as well. Yeah. So it, yeah. it's... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and we, we do. I mean, we're, we've, we've noticed over the last number of years increasing number of referrals from young people with a disability. So again, that probably points to a lack of other supports available when they're coming to us to advocate on their behalf. But another point that, that's come up through the conversation we're having so far, and it's come in as a question as well, it just points out that a young person over the age of 18 is under the remit of HSE, um, don't qualify for an aftercare. Um, payment. So effectively, young people leaving the care system generally will call for aftercare. Young people with disability under the order of the HSC. Now we know that the the goal of every young person, from the conversations we've heard from Tracy and and Alan and Joanne, is independence. So where there's a discrepancy there, where young people with a disability are not given allowance to transition to independent <laughs> living, is that something that that we need to to look at and how that works? Uh, yeah, um, uh, absolutely. You, you know, like a care lever in many respects is different, but in many respects from the point of view of aspirations is no different than any other young person, you know? And at the end of the day, if you go along and look at, you know, any of us from that age, from 18 onwards and whatever, there are supports we, we certainly need and we get. Why are they not given that support though? Well, is we, it's, 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 it, well, from this question, Al, it's just pointing out that, um, um, somebody leaving care with a disability under 18 don't qualify for an aftercare um, payment. So that's, that? that's what, that's what, well, that's what we're, we, we want to discuss. And okay. why it should be like that, I think, is the key question. Okay. Why are we differentiating between young people leaving care without a disability and those under yeah. the audit of the HSE with disability? Why are we differentiating in terms of their own independence and transition to independent living? I think that's the, the key question, isn't it? Charlotte, you might have. Some yeah, on that. that's, that's, I think that's the individualized services is looking at it through that model that uh, it's person-centered and what are the needs and a comprehensive assessment of need of what does that person want to do? Because the rest of us take that, in a sense, if you have your family and your friends and you're already thinking about those things at 16 at your junior cert, you know, what am I going to do and what do I want to be and all of those sorts of questions. So it's a natural way for anybody of that age, young person to have those thoughts so it's how do people explore that with them in a communication uh, that's applicable to them and accessible so that other people understand what that person is trying to communicate um, and there's loads of different ways of that uh, for people now there's so much technology out there so it's capturing that at a younger age 16 17 and exploring that and taking the time and the patience to see what is it that this young person wants to do what are their at 18 and it's crisis and where are we going? And then you have all that other, like uh, Alan talked about his video with rent and homelessness and all that other uh, things going on as well. So it's really about establishing a plan that's human rights based, comprehensive about where to next, what are you gonna do? What's, what's the plan? Um, and, and, and having the ability to reflect on that. Um, uh, I was quite lucky. Because I have my family, but some people don't. Uh, and it must be really challenging, like as I said in the webinar, it must be really challenging for never mind, never mind the person with a disability. Uh, it must be cha challenging for an able bodied person like to have all that on their plate. But it's extra difficult for a person with a disability, trying to think of those situations in terms of, like rent, as you said, it's extra difficult, you know? Mm. That, and that, that brings to another point, again, a question. And, and again, I might start with you, Pat, from, from a, a social care perspective. The point is made that the number of children and people in care with disability represent a very relatively small cohort. So what can we do or what are we doing to make sure the social care professionals have the skills to actually 
deal with and be able to properly and appropriately and effectively manage the needs of young people in care with a disability specifically. Patrick, you're on mute there just so you... Sorry about that, Terry, sorry. Um, from an education point of view, like I, I suppose with Carew coming down the line as well from the point of view of ongoing CPD, and that I, I, I certainly know the likes of ourselves in uh, Monster Technology University now, uh, with CARA, with, with programs like uh, adapted uh, physical activity programs and disability, like those programs right across the, like, uh, across the board, they, they generally run across most undergrad social care programs, uh, you know, across the country. Um, some obviously are more specialist than others in that, but the whole idea there really is that, that they're ingrained as capstone subjects, uh, you know, and I know in many respects people would say, well, you know, that maybe service users with a dis disability would be, you know, a minority or whatever, but that, that's no reason, you know, to say that, okay, well, we just pu push that to the side. I know in our own particular programs, like, you know, over maybe a three or four year degree program, there's about two or three years devoted, you know, stream dev devoted looking at uh, APA, as we call it, adaptive physical um, activity and disability studies. No, but then from the point of view of if you look at CPD with Peru and registration and the whole lot, again, it's it's an area that, again, what I would call maybe the whole area of, say, the, both the, the public and private sector and the voluntary sector need to focus in on as well from a CPD point of view, that it's it's not pushed over to the side and, OK, look, it's, it's only minority, look. The bottom line is ongoing CPD, but most of all, from the point of view of the likes of, ourself, of ourselves in education, that our graduates are, for want of a better word, shovel ready, you know, to hit the ground running when they come out, that they that they know that, that, that they're, they're not coming across service users and not having uh, a, a notion of what their needs are and the right way to approach uh, from the point of view of language and access and all that, you know. I'm sorry, I suppose yeah. it's sorry, Alan. Yeah. It's all about it's all about training. As Absolutely. as I said, it's like if you don't train a person, they're not gonna know what to do. Correct. So, so it's all about start training, basically. Yeah. And that I just want to correct one, Gillian, thank you for that. There's just a correction on a previous um, comment made, but that Gillian said young people uh, with disability do call for an aftercare allowance. So, so the previous uh, one has, has been corrected. There's another question here from a foster parent talking about and asking about, I suppose, the uh, training and supports available to the foster parents, which goes back to the training piece that we've been talking about there. Um, you know, a significant proportion of children in care are in foster care. And again, and, and Charlotte, you maybe speak to this, what training should we be giving to foster parents around uh, fostering a child with a disability? What training is there already? Um, people on the webinar might like to, to comment on that as well, if you know. Um, if you want, um, uh, sorry, Terry, I don't know, you get me. Or, or, I'll get you, Pat, Charlie. Uh, yeah, go uh, ahead. Pat. Charlotte, do you, want to, do you want to take that first and then I might go, whatever, whatever's handy, Charlotte, whatever suits you. Okay. Um, well, look, absolutely. I think continuous professional development, and I suppose to speak from social care perspective, is that it's to get uh, the social care <laughs> ready for registration because that hasn't happened yet. So there is some gaps with some of the service providers around even using that title. So there is a fair bit of work to be done in order to get the registration, to get uh, the social care profession ready. And that's key. It's a key piece in all of this because um, even a lot of the centres uh, that might provide services, um, a lot of them aren't, don't come under HICWA, um, you know, as designated centres and stuff like that. So there is progression uh, in the future for, for this as well. But there, this is fundamental to, to facilitate that role of CPD and protected time. Uh, for workers to go and um, come to CPD mm -hmm. events. Mm -hmm. And we would have had a lot of events around uh, assisted decision making. And we've had uh, Joanna actually speak at an event for us in Social Care Ireland. Um, and maybe Alan, you'd come and, and uh, talk to us mm -hmm. as well. So, um, but that's what it's all about is getting uh, people who have a lived experience and share their stories with professionals and, and with people um, together. 
and was that, I, I suppose adding to what Charles was saying there as well, when we look at I suppose social care professionals as being a major um, you know stakeholder here, like the foster parents, if, if you look at it, if you look at that that question, I know that the the um, the the the, the, um, the the Irish Foster Care Association, if you look at it, we were trying to actually do some work with, with them. And I know our colleagues in IT Carlo had a, a special corpus award and we were trying to actually move stuff nationally. And there's definitely a major gap in the market, you guys. And I have said it time and time again, and it's something, it's, it's on th that long list of to-dos for me and maybe my colleagues, the Irish Association of Social Care Educators, that... A special purpose award, um, you know, and going back to what Charlotte was saying about CPD, like there's no reason in the world that you cannot have um, a, a standalone, an off the shelf mod really for, for, you know, to provide support and training to any prospective uh, foster parents. And one of the main problems, as we know, is like, like there's a lot of reasons why why people get involved in foster care you know, mm -hmm. you know, but one of the reasons why they don't get involved in it is, is is a perceived lack of training and lack of support and i know that the the uh the association has been involved the, the stuff going on there but again i think really at the end of the day if themselves uh, as the association representing foster parents and the likes of of the of, of Tusla, uh, and the colleges come together there's no reason in the world why again it goes back to the simple thing of joining the dots here that it may only involve you know a special purpose award that people would be frightened at that and saying oh god like what does that involve do I need you know x amount of points in my leave and search and maybe I left school early or whatever no no the whole idea basically is you could do something over a day a night you could actually with now the one thing about COVID and the pandemic is it's amazing really what what we have been enabled to do from a technological point of view as well. You don't even have to leave your home, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so there's no reason in the world. And again, I call on like if, if, if there are people from Tusla, you know, um, you know, in this webinar or, or whatever, please email me or whatever. We get that conversation going again. Uh, for the sake of uh, perspective, uh, uh, number one, foster foster parents who are out there at the moment who may feel a little bit lost, and obviously prospective foster parents too. Good, thanks for that, Pat. It just I'm just minded Pat, to, to comment on that in terms of the joined up piece. I know you and I have been talking about you know providing supports at third level for care leavers. Yeah. The other side of that is care leavers with their disability. So whereas some universities. I think you froze and Terry or I froze and one or the other. Needs that are specific to them as well. Would you agree? Sorry, Terry, you might just repeat that. I think you froze there a small little bit, Terry. So, sorry if I did. I'm saying that just in picking up on your joined up thinking, I was saying in, in relation to the work we've done around supports for care leavers going into third level yeah. and supports in place for students with a disability entering third level, there is that piece of work done to be done for care leavers with a disability moving to third level education. And that's that's the joined up piece I think we sometimes miss. You need to put those together because the needs are different again for that cohort of young people. Completely different in the sense that like the major deficit at the moment really from the point of view of it, as everybody knows, if you come along basically and look at say third level education, the amount, like there are supports, right? There's no doubt about it. When you go along and look at it, you know, you talk about this whole notion really of if someone comes into third level, right? we have say PAs, we have assistive technology, we have all of that stuff. But in third level, we still don't recognize the fact that, you know, somebody maybe with a disability, for example, instead of doing that degree in three years, should do it maybe in four or five years. And at, at this moment in time, what's happening is basically a lot of it is based on goodwill and all that type of stuff. It should be part and parcel of policy really that if I, you know, even if you look at a number of disabilities, if you look at somebody who's a wheelchair user or someone with a hearing or, or a visual impairment, for example, right? Just those, just from a pilot point of view, go along and basically say, look guys, that three year degree, you can run it over four or five years. As things stand at the moment, you're 
classed as a part-time student and you, you'll have to pay fees. That's the bottom line. Sorry, Pat, can I just step in there? Yes, Alan. I'm, um, I'm still struggling to go to college. Um, for that reason, I've been told you need funding for a special a PA. PA, yeah. I've been told uh, we, can't, we can't get that funding. Like when I left secondary school, my um, career guidance teacher and the disability nurse in my secondary school tried to get tried to get me to college, but they couldn't do it because it was told I need funding for an SMA. And in in this day and age, it, it should be easier to access those those means that you need, like. It, it doesn't matter if you have a disability, like people with disabilities are, are intelligent, like it, should, it shouldn't uh, mean that you can't go to college. And my struggle is still continue, even after I left secondary school. So it's really annoying, to be honest. Um, yeah, Alan, I, I look, from the point of view of realizing your dreams of going to college, like there's no reason in the world why, you know, you 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 can't go to college or you, you, you shouldn't. Now you're basically saying really that the lack of a PA is there. I know certainly from our own experience, me myself dealing with students with disabilities, um, down here in, in, in Tralee, you don't have that type of situation. I hope to God that there is not a postcode lottery when it comes to um, supporting students with disability. What you say, Alan, there is, I'd like to have a separate conversation with you on that, uh, uh, but, but certainly if that is the case, I would basically, <laughs> I'd implore, uh, like, the, basically the, the, the TUSAs of this world and the HSEs of this world uh, to come along basically and look at, at Alan or any other Alan for that matter, you know, certainly, as far as the support that my students are getting, there's no doubt about it. They, they're getting the support and the support is working. I'm, I can comment, Alan, on your particular case. I'd certainly like to have a conversation with you separately on it, and I will. But I, I, I would hope that, that it's the fact that the lack of a PA is not hindering you or shouldn't hinder you from going to college. I'm, 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 I'm it seems that way, to be honest. And, yeah. I feel, and I feel discriminated by it, to yeah. be honest mm. with you, because... Yeah. I because can't of, comment, on, as I say, on the, on um, the specifics um, of it, but I know certainly our experience, like my experience of the students, like the, the assistive technology is in place, the PAs are in place, a lot of support we have on the ground is in place. And, but certainly, um, I can have that conversation with you. Um, I, I just have a quick question for Charlotte, if you don't mind. Uh, um, Charlotte, um, do, do you find that is a similar issue in, in your line of work where PAs are kind of um, difficult to get for people and stuff? So. That, was, that was going to be my question, Alan, so fair play. Yes. Charlotte. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, as well from the, you know, from the professional body side of it is that that's you know to be a social care worker um in that role to do that and that's where the individualized services comes under and having the social care worker on a one-to-one -one nearly implementing that with people and it's very person-centered so again alan yeah it, it is a challenge because it's a change uh it's a big shift in the way we traditionally do things in Ireland um, yeah. but there has been progression made it's just it's at the the mercy I suppose of funding uh, like everything um, you know the last year has been really tough on everybody and that's so that's where a lot of it has been back um, mm -hmm. so but I would keep saying to keep fighting that and keep banging that drum because the more activists we have like yourself speaking up for your right to access education, the better, because uh, your voice is so important here. Um, and I, I heard you saying earlier, Joanne spoke at one of your events. Uh, where, where was that actually? Uh, 
that was through, uh, we have a disability special interest group and every year they have a conference um, yes. and Joanna spoke about it, um, about decision making. Um, so it was postponed last year, but I will definitely link in with you. Um, go ahead with this year, it'll probably be online like everything else, but. Yeah, just let me know. Definitely link in with you. Thanks, thanks Charlotte. I'm thinking we're, I'm beginning to, we're, we're moving towards the end of time, so I'm going to wrap up. I think that last piece was particularly relevant to the, the theme of these webinars, which is equity. And I think, you know, if a young person can't access their level of education because of the need of an SNA, that's the equity piece to give them a quality we need to look at. Um, there were a lot of other questions around transport education for care leavers and, and young people with disability leaving care. A lot of questions we'll get to again. So if you do still have questions, please send them in and we will get to them. But I want to kind of close, um, if I can now, with maybe a final thought from each of you on, on this area specifically. So if uh, you could give us one maybe fine closing thought on what you, if there was one thing you would like to see changing within the system for young people and children in care with a disability, what that might be. Uh, I might start with you, Alan. Um, I suppose it's just trying to be more the the equity and equality piece. Uh, it, it's just trying to understand the issues of a caregiver, but also understand the issues of a person with a disability, because it's two different things. But mm -hmm. it might it might seem similar, but it's not. Um, so. I'd call on Tuesday the kind of um the kind of kind of push that and say that it's kind of different and I'd also call on um like disability centers like IWA to kind of continue to provide a, a person. Uh, center service like they are doing, so that's what I do. That's what I do. Um, kind of, um, that's what I kind of want to to say. And I'd like to wish everyone a happy birthday on the nineteenth of February. So, thanks, 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 Alan. Charlotte, over to you. Any any final thought? Yeah, it's, it's so great to have this uh, debate here today and thank you for the invite and again, yes, happy care uh, day on, on Friday and I suppose it's it's just that investment of time to, to listen and be patient uh, and to build up a relationship with the person um, because at the end of the day, it's their life, um, not yours and it has to be through their will and preference. What is What is it that they want for their future? And build that capacity so that people can make their decisions uh, and stand over them in the communication uh, that, that suits them, not what we expect. Um, and not to be so focused on solutions, but on that journey that you have um, as advocates do, uh, as you know, in Epic. And so that's what's funny. It's just that listening um, with kindness, uh, your theme for today um, is, is, is a keynote for, for right, me. Thank, thank you, Charlotte. Finally, to you, Pat. Uh, final thought. You're on mute again. Sorry about that, Terry, again. Okay. Uh, I was going to say, how do I follow um, <laughs> Alan and Charlotte? Basically, as far as I'm concerned, I think every every person's dream and every every dream needs to be realized. And um, as far as I'm concerned, really, the whole area of say person-centered person planning really is where we need to go. Um, and I suppose most of all, from a policy point of view, to let's start realizing that there's no one size fits all. We're all, we all have our own, I suppose, unique uh, abilities and disabilities and stuff like that. And at the end of the day, I think really, for us to move forward as a, a, socially, as a socially decent society, uh, we need to make sure really that we try to realise all, all the dreams we have as best we can. And again, can I just wish everybody a happy care day as well. And thanks to you all for putting this together. I think it's been a wonderful debate. And I think hopefully this, this, we'll, we'll do it again sometime as well. You know? Absolutely. Thanks uh, Thanks to you, to you all. Thanks to you, Pat, to you, Charlotte, and to you, Alan. I'd also like to thank everybody who joined us, anybody who sent in questions. As I said, we'll, we'll address those questions. This is the 
uh, I hope the beginning of a continued conversation around this issue. And if anybody wants to join in the conversation, please let us know because we, we do want to reach out to individual organizations to, to move this forward. Um, I also want to thank, say thank you to the EPIC team and the, 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 the working group who organized this particular webinar. Um, wish everybody a happy Care Day on Friday, 2021. Remind everybody if they're using social media, if you could help us by using the, 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 the hashtag Care Day 21, that would be a huge help to us and to all the children and young people in care. So thank you all for joining us. Thanks for your contributions. Um, we look forward to can this, continuing this conversation and I wish you all a great day and a great week and a great Care Day. So thank you and, and goodbye for now. safety net sometimes it feels i do sleep walking through a maze with no end in sight and i don't read the headlines and i don't read the news cause it's easy just to lose faith every time that i do sometimes it feels like i'm falling off a conveyor belt with no safety net Cause they've got eyes, but they just don't see All the damage they've done to people like me They'll talk like angels before I price Well, people are dying for their rights, no Safety nets just don't exist after this conveyor belt After this conveyor belt So I build on myself And I feel lighter With my feet firm On the ground Like I can breathe For the first time In a long time I am free And I don't read the headlines And I don't read the news Cause it's easy just to lose faith every time that I do Sometimes it feels like I'm falling off a conveyor belt With no safety net Cause they've got eyes but they just don't see All the damage they've done to people like me They'll talk like angels before a price what people are dying for their rights, no safety nets just don't exist after this conveyor belt. After this conveyor belt, single mothers, prison cells, hopeful the home.
homeless is this what you sell hopeless don't know what a home is can you tell scope this don't get a second chance if i fell i need focus left at 17 to drown in this ocean life hit till i broke down like erosion needed to escape so i drank a potion because i seek a happiness that's potent too many policy try to abolish me stand against robbery in this economy it's like the lottery pocket the profit they're making a mockery I'm falling down way too many times who do i follow now when the blind lead the blind i become so lost i'm always losing my mind oh there's something that i keep trying to find Cause they've got eyes, but they just don't see All the damage they've done to people like me They'll talk like angels, but for a price While people are dying for their rights No safety nets just don't exist After this command about After this command